Welcome to Access Church. We're stoked you're with us. Before we get into the teaching today, grab your Bible, your note sheet, and maybe your favorite beverage, and be ready to receive all that God has for you today. All right, lots going on, and so uh, this is an exciting season for us. Uh, this week we start connection groups. Email will go out today, and so if you signed up, you are good to go. So we got Wednesday, Thursday night. If you're not in a group, encourage you uh, to sign up. You can go on our website or on our app. And so we're going to get going. We got about a six week uh, early fall, then we'll take a week or two break, and then uh, we'll do like another six weeks into Thanksgiving. So it's going to be a really good season for us. Um, if you don't get an email and you signed up, let me know because somehow we have a disconnect. We don't have you on there. So uh, if by tonight you don't have an email, then let me know first thing, uh, text or email me. Also, next week, Children's Ministry, we have revamped it, and so we're very excited. It kind of officially launches in September, but Laura Lee has overtaken that, done a lot of uh, different stuff, and so we're excited about that. And so uh, next Sunday after church, we'll have food. So if you signed up or you didn't, but we recruited you and told you that you're on, so uh, either way. Uh, Just a heads up, uh, next Sunday is a training for that. So uh, email will be going out today with more uh, details. Hey, you guys, uh, we always like to let you know kind of what's going on with church family. People are kind of regular attenders, things like that. And so uh, Miley has been with us. You'll notice you kind of see her for a little bit, and you don't see her. And then you see her, and you don't, well, she's in college. So she's got to go back. Is this your last year for your nursing degree? Last year, nursing degree. Uh, yeah, you can clap for that. That's a good, yeah. Um, and so just want to pray for her. Anytime people kind of go, you know, with Young Life, that they go to camps, uh, people move, things like that, we want to be able to pray, be, uh, just be praying for her. Uh, it'll be a really busy year. And so uh, just continue growth in faith, uh, getting this done, and she's got a lot of other things going on. So we're going to pray for her. Also, I want to give you an update. Um, Stan's son, we've been praying for Mike McDonald. Uh, and so uh, keep praying for him, the family. He has, uh, is it cancer? Or is it just the tumor? Is, it is, okay. They don't know yet, but they, they've been dealing with some medical things. So his son, uh, keep praying for him. You guys have been hearing uh, about him. His name's Mike. And then Diane, uh, we haven't seen her for a while. So she has uh, also just started chemo. Uh, keep praying for her because it's, uh, it's just still up and down with all kinds of issues with her organs and things like that. So She'd appreciate prayers, uh, and uh, she knows that you guys are praying for her. So that's kind of like what's going on during the week as you're thinking about it, something like that, be, uh, be praying for them. But Miley's taking off tomorrow. You're out. So I um, asked her if she wanted to give a speech. She said, nope, so I'm going to pray for her. And, uh, and then we'll get on. If you have your Bibles, we will be in Luke 18. That's where we're going to be today. So Jesus, thank you for uh, Miley, for her family, God, just how she's grown up. And uh, Lord, knowing you, seeing you, uh, experiencing you, and God, it's just great to see her go just from a child uh, to a young woman and just um, just learning in life and growing and becoming a nurse, which is an amazing profession, one of healing, one of comfort, one of encouragement. God, I pray that this would just be an amazing uh, year for her in college. I pray it'd be great growth as far as just her really learning how to do that job well, that she would see it not just as a job, but as a ministry and just really affecting people, that people will remember her by the smile, by the encouragement, by the way she helps, by the way she just uh, saves lives, Lord. And so we pray that you would just give her wisdom, give her discipline that she needs. God, I pray you continue to just uh, build great relationships around her and just people that uh, love you, uh, encourage her, but also in her profession, God. And so I pray that those friendships would be strengthened. And so God, I just pray through it all. I know there's gonna be stressful times over the next year, but I pray that she would see you in her daily life in the stress, in the worry, um, as things come up, Lord, that you would really walk with her and her eyes would be open to you. So we just bless her, God, as a church. We thank her for just being here. She does a lot of behind-the-scenes things and for just serving here, God, when she's free. And God, we just pray, we just give her to you and uh, pray that you would bless her. In your name, Jesus, amen. Awesome, yeah, super proud of you. All right, you guys, Luke 18 is where we're gonna be. And we're gonna go over an interesting passage. Um, you know, it's interesting when you think about, you talk about childhood memories. Uh, for most of us, when you're a kid, what do you want to do? You, well, yeah, you want to play. All right, well, that's not the answer I was looking for. This is not going well. No, you want to play, but you kind of want to grow up, right? It's always, what do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, and so 
you can't wait. And then as you do grow up, like you can't wait to experience certain things, right? If you have an older brother or sister, they get to stay out later than you, right? And so you can't wait to move from like five or six to 10 and your bedtime changes or 13, right? And then as a preteen, maybe an older brother or sister driving and you can't wait to be old enough to drive. And, and it, it kind of goes on and on with those kinds of things. But then as you get older, what do you desire? You wish you were a kid again, right? <laughs> This is a weird paradox. You're a kid and you want to get older. Then you get older and you see the stress. You're like, oh, I wish I was a kid just running around the flower fields. You know, just, you know, the, the stresses of a kid didn't seem like that big of a deal. We're going to be talking about that type of thing when it comes to being childlike. Jesus has a powerful view of children and being childlike. Not childish, childlike. Those are two different things. And so... We see over and over in the scriptures, if, if you've been reading Luke, or if you read uh, Matthew especially, you see multiple times where Jesus is being questioned, or people are asking about something, and who does he grab? A child. Literally multiple times, brings in a child and says, I want to illustrate something. We pick up in Luke 18, 15, check this out. It says that people were bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. They wanted their children to be blessed by God. When the disciples saw this, they what? Rebuked them. You got to understand in this culture, there was a, a, a division, this whole thing called helicopter parenting. I don't know if you've heard of that, or tiger moms, you know, or anything like that. that or mama bears. Didn't really exist back then. And so back then, you had a lot of kids, just so you know, that was your retirement plan. Like a lot of you invest money. Yeah, they didn't have that. If you didn't have a lot of kids, your retirement plan did not look good because you're hoping one out of 10 would be successful. You're hoping, you know, you're just kind of playing the odds. Or if you have one or two, you're like, oh, this could be dangerous, right? Much different than now. Uh, back then too, also it was protection. Um, it was help. It was also a kind of a status symbol being blessed by God but it wasn't like kids ruled the roost. They didn't have sports where you're running around and kind of running after them. And when it came even to church, there was a division. They would split, you know, kind of uh, kids and, and, and adults and, and kids were expected to uh, really not be seen or heard. I remember multiple times doing um, uh, missions in India or Africa. And when we'd go, and we're going to these little villages, literally mud huts. I mean, we're out in the boonies. There's times I've shared with you guys where we were the first Americans, or for some of us that were white, the first white that they'd ever seen. Little kids come up and scratching our arm because like, what's that white dust on them, right? This is who we're meeting with, right? And it was interesting that even in this type of a culture, when we would go and share, they would tell the kids, go away, and you could look behind the door or you look through the window, but you don't sit at the front. That's for the adults. That's the mindset, okay? So they were just doing cultural things. So I was ah, get out of the way. We got more, there's more important things to do than talk to kids about Jesus. Sometimes churches can do that. Children's ministry can be an afterthought. You're wondering why we're putting so much investment, time, money in children's ministry. This church cannot flourish if the kids don't flourish. Why? They're very important to God. You're going to see that. Children's ministry is not an afterthought. It's not like, oh, that's kind of cute, little babysitting. Children's ministry, right now, what's happening with your kids is just as important to Jesus what's happening here just as powerful. So what's Jesus do? I, I, if you read the Bible, it's so interesting how, how many times people under the assumption that they're responding in a godly way and Jesus says, you're nowhere even close to having a godly perspective. It says that, but Jesus called the children to him. So they rebuked in an awkward moment. Jesus like, no, 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 no. I'm going to call you to me. He said, let the little children come to me and do not, what? You can say it. Hinder, get in the way. Do not get in the way of them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. It's interesting when you read, um, I encourage you to read sometimes in bulk volume because you get a bigger perspective. I don't think it's always good because then you forget what you read, but when you read multiple gospels, they give a little bit different detail of what, of what happened. It's not a different story, just a little bit different detail. When we read the same story in Mark 10, 
it actually says that when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. That means super mad. There's another word I could use, but I won't in church, but that mad, all right? Because sometimes we kind of gloss over and make the book all religious. Jesus was angry. So we don't really see that in Luke, but if you kind of begin to, to, when you're reading the Bible, bring in other verses to get a bigger picture, you'll see that in this moment, Jesus was actually angry with them. Jesus gets angry when we hinder children from experiencing and understanding them. And he goes on to say, beyond this, he says, truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. That's crazy. Like a little child, we, we dismiss the little children. He's like, no, you actually need to be like them. Now he says, be childlike, not childish. So we're going to talk about what the Bible defines as childlike. Like what, is, what does Jesus mean by childlike? Let him define it rather than we define it in, in our own terms, right? But we see in this passage here, and it's really interesting because remember, Jesus is going to the cross now. We're getting into Luke where the heat is starting to heat up. And when you know that your life is kind of getting to the end, you, your, your conversations are heavier. I was just, you know, Stan was telling me he had some time with his son, right? Because these kind of things that happen when there's tumors or cancer, things like that, your conversations, you could care less about basketball. You could care less about golf. That's for people who think they're going to live forever here. Could care less what's happening in government or education. I just care about that human being. Sometimes we miss that, right? I remember with my mom when she was passing away, and we knew it. Yeah, we didn't talk about frivolous TV shows. Could care less. We're talking about deeper things in life. Jesus was talking about deeper things in life. Bethany and Grace, you guys are back? Oh my gosh, welcome back. I'm so sorry. I'm too ADD. Yay! If you're watching on video, sorry. I just got distracted, but they've been doing ministry for many, many months. And oh, it's so good to have you back. I'm so excited. Okay, back to it. I forgot what I was saying, so I totally blanked. Yeah, I'm so stoked. So can't wait to hear how it went. All right, they're embarrassed now. So, <laughs> um, You have to have childlike faith, not childish, childlike. So I want to unpack that. I want to unpack the value of kids and what does it mean to be childlike in our faith because he says that you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's really important because I think some of us want to enter the kingdom of God like a full-grown adult where we've thought everything through and we're in control, but I'm going to enter into your kingdom, but I'm going to enter it into it where it's kind of my kingdom merging with your kingdom. And I'll take a little bit of your kingdom and what I like, but I'm going to mainly, and God says, you're actually not living in my kingdom at all. There is no equal in his kingdom. You actually have to become childlike to even enter. So even the many of us that have been following God for a while, are you following God with childlike faith? Or really it's a combination of faith in yourself and your faith in God, and you kind of bring the two together. So we're going to be unpacking that today. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about when it comes to children and Jesus, this is really important uh, for families, but also even if you don't have kids, if you have influence, you're a teacher, or you're an aunt, or you're an uncle, this is really, really important. Because he uses very strong words. Children and Jesus, the first point is this. You can write this down. They are important and valuable to him. Don't make it hard for them to know and follow God. A lot of times when we go through seasons as parents and we're just like, well, I'm just struggling or, you know, we just, uh, we think of kids as our own and what we don't realize is they're actually, uh, they're God's. They're not yours. You, your DNA created them, but he actually brought life to them. If it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, the, 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 the clumps of cells would not turn into a human being. I think we forget that. So as much as you're like, well, it's my wife's and I, you know, not really. There's nothing, there's no life. The Bible says life comes through Jesus. And so he says, listen, you are borrowing them, you're not owning them. And you see two different parenting styles when someone thinks they own their kids Versus they're just borrowing and giving them back to God. You parent in two different ways. And here's the thing, it doesn't matter how you feel like you're parenting. What I want to do in my life with my kids is, how does God think I'm parenting? And he says, listen, they are valuable. Don't ever forget that. But not valuable in the sense of worshiping them or 
they're the center of my life because that means Jesus is in the center of my life. In fact, kids are, feel most loved and comfortable when they're not the center of your life. They're not meant to be God where they dictate everything. That's a very unhealthy thing to do to any human being. Why do you think so many rock stars are on drugs and drinking? Why? You see the interviews? Many of them, when, it's be, when you're on stage and thousands of people are yelling your name, screaming, crying when you're in the room, that messes up a human being's head. Someone's like, oh, that'd be so cool. No. There's a reason. It's not, it, doesn't men, it doesn't make you mentally stable when you are worshipped. No human being can handle that. Only God's meant to handle that. Don't do it to your kids. But the Bible says also be, recognize this, that they are gods and don't make it hard for them. That's why Jesus is so angry. They actually kept the kids from Jesus. And he's like, no, I want them here. I want them here. Matthew 18, 6 through 7 <laughs> gives a really graphic warning. I, lo- I love it how graphic Jesus is because he doesn't mince words. Matthew 18, 6 and 7 says this, if anyone causes one of these little ones, and in this passage, you know what he did? He grabbed a kid. He has no problem. Just so you know, Jesus loves awkward moments. We try to avoid awkward moments. We want church to be, don't make it awkward, make it. And Jesus is like, I love awkward moments. Because awkward moments makes you wrestle with things in your heart. And when we're all nice and neat and don't make it awkward, we never wrestle with the deeper things. He grabs a kid, awkward moment, points to the kid, looks at them while pointing the kid, and says this, if anyone causes one of these little ones right here to stumble, those who believe in me to stumble, this little child believes in me, oh, it's a little child. They, they, they don't have enough intellect. They don't know what it means to, to follow God. And I think Jesus looks at them and goes, no, you don't know what it means. They do. That's why we baptize kids here. Well, are they a Christian or are they not Christian? Why are we questioning? If, if they're professing, then we baptize. And we trust God for them to figure out their faith later on. Don't hinder the little kids. He says, those who believe in me, but don't cause any of these ones to stumble. It would be better for them. So this is better. To have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. And there's like, where is this guy staying? It would be better for you to do that right now, if you make it hard for kids, to go and drown yourself. Woe to the world because of these things that cause people to stumble. He's saying it's better to go drown yourself than to deal with God himself because of how angry he gets when we don't treat children right. This is why, as Christians, the world needs to see what we rejoice over, but they also need to see what we get angry over. It's okay for the world to see us angry. You know, when we talk about, oh, we need to love the world, and, and here's the thing. We're not trying to run away from the world. We're trying to engage them, but they should see what we're engaged about and what we stand for. We stand for salvation through Christ. Nobody can do it on their own. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. We're all broken and fragile. But what we stand for, children are valuable. So it's a big deal of a heartbeat in a womb. We don't compromise that. And I know that's difficult because there are many women in a lot of churches, and it makes it awkward because maybe you've experienced that. And it's like, oh, I'm going to feel guilty or shameful. No, 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 no. If you fall in that area, God forgives all sins. It's amazing. All sins. But though we can empathize, we don't compromise. Though we can empathize saying that was a difficult, and I don't know the pressures. I can't imagine the things being said. As I shared last week, they were being said to my mom, baby number two, can't afford. I already got my older sister. You don't need a son. It's too much. What kind of a life is he going to have? I'd love to see those people now. I'd love to see them now and say, how dare you? But there's grieving there. For many of us that maybe experience that, it's like, oh, Brian, you're bringing up there's a grieving. It's okay, grieve, but Jesus loves you. And he'll meet you there. But as we empathize, we cannot compromise. And so when it comes to mutilating little kids to change their gender, no. No. Brian, that's not Christian. Yes, it is. It's very. Jesus wasn't like, oh, I can understand why you guys want to keep the little kids. Yeah, I can. He was angry. 
Now, my anger doesn't turn to hate with people that have that view, but my anger says, no, I need you to see. Sometimes people then need to see someone angry to be like, oh, yeah, that's right. I should be angry about that. Oh, that's right. That's not a good thing. And when Christians just kind of be like, ah, don't show any emotion, the world doesn't see any passion. I love you, but I'm angry right now. Are you guys seeing where I'm going with this? Not just our culture, though, but even with our little kids. Parents, don't cause your kids to stumble. How can we do that? By our own example, we bring them to church, but they don't see church at home. We talk about love here, but they see short tempers, anger, words that should not be said to them, but then we come to church and we smile and we worship. And that causes them to stumble because they think, oh, hypocrisy is okay. What is church about? Church is about singing song, being passionate, but then when I'm at home, it's pretty much doing your own thing. Do they see repentance? Do they see growth? Do they see humility? Do we crack open the Bible at all or do we wait for church to do it? That's causing kids to stumble. So the Bible says, listen, you want to be a parent? Great. I know parenting is kind of the in thing now, right? Produce some babies, put on my Instagram, look at my little kid, you know, right? It's like, that's cool. But it's not just for fun. There's a purpose to it. And that purpose isn't just to myself and my desire to have kids, but also to God. And God says, listen, your number one thing is make sure they know him, which means school should not be greater than Jesus. Well, they have to miss youth group. Well, they have to miss this because they better get a 4.0. You're hindering your kids. Well, they're going to be a D1 athlete. I know. No, no, they're not. You weren't a D1 athlete. They will not be a D1 athlete. None of your grandkids will be D1 athletes. I'm just, I know. I just broke your heart right now. You're like, no. Just, I need you to hit reality. They're not. They're not. But we pay thousands for sports and then struggle to tithe. We go out every night and we struggle to get to church because they have to be on the travel team. I saw that when Aiden was swimming. You're hindering. God doesn't care how fast they are, how smart they are. You do. God doesn't. He wants to make sure that they know him forever. That's what he cares about. Did I hit that hard enough? How much important? Yeah, I think I did. You guys are valuable, and we have to value them here at church. If they're not your kids and you see them running around here, smile, by the way. Play with them. But they're not my kids. It's okay. Give them a high five. Treat kids here special because Jesus says you should be fortunate you guys even have a children. And I hope we always value that. It's very valuable to Jesus. Now, not only are kids important in this passage, but he says we should reflect. God gives us the gift of kids. And by the way, Jesus could have set this up where we give birth, and you know that he could have set it up where they are fully mature as soon as you're birth. You know he could have done that, right? It's not impossible. Like you pop out a baby, and they could already talk, they could already think, they could already do things, they're already coordinated. You know that's not impossible. So have you, and maybe you've never thought of this, that's why I have time as a pastor, and these are the things I think about, so it's what you pay me to think about, but I'm like, wouldn't that be weird if that happened? Like, boop, and the kid's like, hey, mom, how you doing? Wouldn't that be crazy? You know, I'm ready to start work tomorrow. Let's go. You know, you're just like, man. Now, some of you right now, I can tell moms would be like, I would love that. <laughs> like, some of you are like, oh, I wish he would do that, right? Why did God set it up to where they pop out and they have to develop? Because here's the thing. Kids aren't only important to God. They're also a reflection in some way of spiritual truths. And he wants us to understand that kids at that stage actually can teach us something about our own faith. And so that's why God allows it. Childlike faith. They're not just important to Jesus, but also we should reflect on how kids in a childlike way approach life. He says we should approach him. So three points here. Salvation with childlike faith. Salvation with, because he's saying you have to have childlike faith to have salvation. What does that look like? What does he mean by childlike and not childish? First one is this. I am dependent on God, not my own instinct or intellect. I'm dependent on God, not my own instinct or intellect. For any of us to receive salvation, we have to give up the way we think about life ourselves completely and say, you tell me how to do life. 
And that's super hard. Has anyone noticed how hard that is? And so he says, listen, what I mean by that is you are dependent on God for your purpose each day. Your purpose is no longer to just make money, to be self-fulfilled. That now your purpose is his purpose. Find people disconnected and try to love them to Jesus. And then for you to be close to Jesus and to love as he's loved you. That's the purpose. Like, that's the primary purpose. Now, there might be other purposes where he speaks. There's general purpose and there's specific purpose. Are you even listening of what, who he wants you to talk to today? Who he wants you to text? Who he wants you to reach out to? He has specific purposes. What ministry does he call for you throughout the week? Some it's young life, right? For some it's other types of ministries, other things. And so now I say, my week is no longer, oh, I just booked my whole week. Now it's, God, what do you want this week? And ask him, what does he require of me? I am dependent on God also for my provisions, not just my purpose, my provisions that he will provide. I don't have to stress out. So I'm dependent on him for my wealth, for my health. I'm dependent on him. That's why God says, I choose the years that you live, not you. Brian, I eat blueberries, and I do CrossFit, and I do all that. It doesn't matter. He determines the years, right? And so I'm dependent on him for my provision. I'm dependent on him for my protection. This is why when someone wrongs you, you don't have to go on the internet and show them up and tell them why they're wrong or make them feel bad, or you don't have to argue at school because you're trying to defend yourself. And the Bible says, I'll defend you over and over. God's like, I will be your defender. You don't have to defend yourself. Notice when they were accusing Jesus before he went to the cross, they were accusing him. What did Jesus say as they were accusing him? Zero. He said nothing. God the Father will take care of me. I don't have to take care of myself. Jesus was completely dependent. Jesus had a childlike faith where I'm dependent. None of your four, five, six-year-olds have ever come up to you and been like, hey, how you doing with the bills, right? Has, has anyone had a kid? Like, they're not thinking about your bills, right? Okay. Any of them come up to you and be like, hey, how you doing? You look a little stressed today. Is you doing all right? Do I need to change my attitude? Is there anything going on? Right? They're dependent on you and they trust you. And I can be fully dependent on God when I fully trust him. They believe that you are powerful enough and you are good enough, even though in your mind you're like, but I'm not. They don't know that, so don't tell them, Right? Remember when you were a little kid and your dad could do, I remember my dad could do anything. Anything, right? Now as we grow up, we realize, oh, they, they couldn't. But with God, that never changes. So if I'm going to come to God, I have to come dependently on him, no longer depending on my own instinct or intellect. That, well, the God probably thinks the way I do. If I'm going to have salvation, I have to say he thinks nothing like me and my instinct is probably almost always wrong. Let me go to his instinct his intellect into the word of God. Matthew uh, 18, one through five says this, Jesus reiterates, he says, at that time the disciples came to Jesus and said, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? <laughs> Once again, he called a little child to him. Place the child, again, he does it again. Use it as an illustration, him as an illustration, or her as an illustration. Truly I tell you, unless you change, unless you what? Change. If you become a Christian with childlike faith, that means you change. And it says that unless you change and become like little children, you'll no longer enter or you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What's the lowly position? They're, they're completely dependent on adults. That's the lowly position. Because why? It kind of stinks to be dependent on someone, right? It kind of stinks. You kind of want to make it on your own, Right? But what the Bible says, it doesn't stink when you're dependent on Jesus because he always comes through. You can trust him. Luke 10, 21, Jesus even prays this. This is a crazy prayer. I don't, know if, I don't think we covered this when we went through Luke, but he said, at the time, full of the Holy Spirit, he said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things, that means the truth of God, from the wise and the learned. Jesus actually hides himself from people that are arrogant, thinking, well, I'll believe in God, but you have to make it all intellectually clear, and I have, to, I have to go through every argument, 
and if you win every argument, then I'll become a Christian. Have you ever met people like that? I debated them in college. You know what I learned? As soon as I debunked one thing, they come up with another. They never had a desire to follow God. They're just trying to figure out a way to defend why they don't want to follow God. And it's futile. It's one of those things I'm like, why am I doing this? I was just wasting my time. Because God doesn't come to you saying, I can answer all your questions. What he says is, trust me in the midst of all your questions. When you don't have an answer, am I still good enough, powerful enough, and do I reveal enough through the cross that that's all you need to know? And again, even with our kids, I don't tell our kids everything about what's going on in life. It's not theirs to know when they're seven, when they're eight, when they're nine. I just give them enough for what they can handle. And that's what God does with you. When you have a child like faith, he gives you enough. He's not going to give you everything. That's what heaven is. Second thing, salvation with childlike faith. So I come dependent to God. The other thing is with a childlike faith is I desire and enjoy mimicking Jesus. A salvation with childlike faith, I desire and enjoy mimicking Jesus. Have you noticed that this, I'll, I'll pick on the sons and the dads uh, because I experienced those Aiden. Have you ever seen a son and a dad walking? Like, let's say they're walking in front of you. Have you ever, have you ever noticed something almost all the time? They walk what? They walk the same. I remember I, I was at the beach and, and Aiden and I uh, were, were walking to, the, um, uh, to go into the ocean and we came back and someone's like, oh, your son, he walks just like you. And I never noticed that before. And then I'm like, well, I don't, you know, then I got paranoid about how, I'm like, how do we walk? Don't we walk normal like everybody else? I guess not. I guess, I guess we got a little bit of the gangster hit. Yeah, you know, I don't know what we do, but. Uh, because you know that he's my son because he's been hanging around me every day. And he just picks up on what dad does, right? How do I know if you're following Jesus? It's not by if you come to church and it's not by if you cry when you worship. Here's how I know if you follow Jesus. When we go out those doors, do you walk like Jesus? Do you forgive like he's forgiven you? Do you even desire to love the way he's loved you? Do you have his wisdom? Do you speak his words? When I, when we talk, one of the things we're going to do in Connection Group, this might have some of you leave Connection Group. I hope, I hope you stay in, but... The first two weeks, you know what we're going to be doing? We're just going to be evaluating our walks with God before we start talking about our walks with God. I'm going to do a two-week thing saying, wait, let's stop. Do you have a heart for Jesus before we start talking about Jesus in groups? So we're just going to take, and that's scary to contemplate. Because if I look at my life saying, now I'm not saying we're going to be perfect. Like, I'm not saying that you walk around healing lepers, you know, you die, you rise. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the character of God, not the performance of God. Walking with Jesus doesn't mean you perform like him. That was his calling. He's called to go to the cross. God's called none of you to go to the cross. But what he said is, if you hang around me, you should have my character. And not perfectly, but if there's nothing like it, no self-control, no love, no joy, no peace, no patience, no kindness, I think that's a time to evaluate saying, okay, then you're hanging around Jesus, but you're not mimicking him. And what we can do is many times we can hang around Jesus, but we're looking at the world. We're hanging around Jesus, but we wonder what other people think rather than what God thinks. Never forget this. Thousands and thousands of people saw Jesus. Tens of thousands saw Jesus. When he went to heaven, do you know how many were left that were with him? About 120. You can hang around Jesus and look nothing like him. Jesus says, childlike faith is, I love the way you walk, Jesus. I love the way you overlook sin in my life, and now I want to overlook others. I don't have to be super sensitive about how people wrong me. I can overlook it because you've overlooked so many things. Jesus, I love how generous you've been with me. Oh my gosh, you've been so generous. I look back over my life, and now I want to mimic you. I want to be generous with others. Whether they thank me or not, I want to be generous. And so I walk like Jesus because I view money like Jesus views money. I view relationships like he views relationships. I view this life how he views this life. Ephesians 5, 1 through 2 says this, follow God's example as dearly loved children. 
and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice. Basically, God's purpose for you is, listen, just be a reflection of me, how I have treated you, now go and treat others. And that's the way of life. And you'll be looking like, people will look at you and be like, eh, you look like that Bible verse there. People will read a Bible verse and go, oh, that's her. Oh, that's, how cool would that be? And that's how we have childlike faith. The last one is this. A childlike faith accepts God's correction and discipline as good and from love. A childlike faith expects to be corrected and disciplined. How many of you guys have kids? How many have kids? Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Keep them by. Come on. Yeah, you guys aren't that proud. Like some people are like, I don't know, right? Keep your hands up. All right, keep your hands up. No, no, no. Come on. Come on. It's a workout. I know. How many of you guys now with kids have never corrected or disciplined them? Never. Raise your hands. Never. <laughs> That's not a good way to parent, right? They don't pop out and you're like, ah, good to go. And you never, good parenting corrects and disciplines as, and it's good and it's from love, or at least it should be. You see, healthy correction and discipline is actually good and should come from love. Now, some of us struggle with that because if you're like me, two abusive dads, so correction and discipline is more like yelling, shaming, now I don't want people to know my deficiencies, so I want to hide because I hid from them. But they didn't do it for good and from love. They did it because they were angry, bitter, empty men. But God's not that way. So when I became a Christian, I had to transition because I wanted to hide from God. So every time I sinned, I didn't want to go to church. I didn't want to look another Christian in the eye. I skipped group. I didn't want to read my Bible because I thought, oh man, because he's going to act like my dad. What's wrong with you? And what we don't understand is, no, God's completely different. He goes, no, I'm going to correct you. I'm going to say some hard things. I'm going to use consequences of life to humble you. I'm going, to, I'm going to do that. But it's actually for your good and from love. And when you understand, those of us that grew up in healthy homes, right, where you saw that your parents did it with love, but they were firm, but you saw how it benefited you, how you grew up and you weren't spoiled, you could manage money, you could manage your emotions, you could critically think. Where'd you learn that from discipline? Where your parents stopped you and be like, no, 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 you can't just roll around on the ground like that in Target. Yeah, that, that's not going to play here. And a loving parent's like, you can't do life that way. You can't be 23 and you don't like your boss and you're in your office screaming and yelling and then you just quit. But why do we have adults doing that today? They weren't disciplined. Look at God's view when it comes to how we should be as parents, which means it shows how he is as a parent. God's just sharing his own heart as a parent. If you were children, he's a father. And he's also saying, hey, mimic me in this way. Proverbs, uh, let's go 13.24. Whoever spares the rod hates their child. And by the way, the rod, I know for some of us, it's like, oh, Jesus is saying, hey, go out and get the biggest stick. Some of us grew up that way. Some of us grew up that I had to do that. I had to pick actually a stick off the tree. That was the 80s. That was, I think it stopped after the 80s, but we still had to go to the tree. It was either that or uh, I got spanked with, you guys don't remember, but the jelly slippers in the 80s, the jelly ones. And they were, they were oh my gosh. They, they, yeah, so I'd rather have a tree branch than those jelly slippers. So I was like, I would run out and get the, get the branch from the tree. But, um, you know, some of us look at that and what God's saying is, hey, beat your kid with the rod or you hate them. He's not saying that. He's, he's using hyperbole here to kind of show as far as this thing of, listen, when there's not discipline, you actually hate your child. No, but I love them. No, but you actually hate them because they'll never learn and be an adult. He goes on to say, but the one who loves their children is careful not to beat them, right? With the rod. He's using a, you know, a wordplay here. He doesn't say that, but is careful to discipline them. Just, you know, that Hebrew word could also mean just correcting. It means change the course of action. But the one who loves their children is careful to discipline. What's the key word there when you see that sentence? What do you think the key word is? Careful. I 
I want to encourage you parents with this. Don't raise your kids to be perfect by the time they're 18 and leave the house. And don't expect your 15-year-old to act like you at 45 years old. That's impossible. If God gave you time to mature, give them time. And I encourage you with this. Work on the key thing of correcting them in an age-appropriate way and let Jesus take care of the rest as they get older. Don't work on everything. Jesus gave us 10 commandments. He didn't give us 1,000. Be like, memorize 1,000. He gave you 10. Don't give your kids 1,000 ways that they need to correct everything. You're going to overwhelm them. Be careful. And here's the thing. God is also careful to discipline you. Usually he gives you one or two things to work on, but in his mind there's 1,000. Just so you know, I know sometimes, especially with young guys, when I work with a youth group, I remember young guys would be like, oh, if I could just stop lusting, like, then I'd just be so freed up to follow God. And I'm like, uh, no, that's just one of a thousand. God's just revealing that for now. He's got a whole list later on in life. Be careful to discipline. And God's careful. That's where he's good. He's loving. He's not looking to overwhelm you. Proverbs 19:18 says this, discipline your children, for in that there is hope. Do not be a willing party to their death. You actually relationally and emotionally kill someone when you don't parent them with careful discipline that's good for them and it's done in love. You kill future relationships. You kill future job opportunities. And sometimes you can even kill their faith before it begins for them to walk with God if you don't discipline correctly. And it's the same thing God does with us. The reason he disciplines you is actually to save you so you don't kill yourself, whether it's spiritually, kill yourself emotionally, or to kill yourself relationally. So he does it out of love. That's why Hebrews 12 says this, verse 7 and 8. Endure hardship as discipline. Endure hardship as discipline. I was talking to a, a, a young woman this week uh, at the gym, and she said, oh, I'm, you know, I'm kind of going through this you know, difficult thing, and, and another Christian said, like, you know, hey, it's just the devil going after you. And I said, well, it might be, or it might be God correcting you. Not every hardship is from the devil. Sometimes we give the devil too much credit. Even the devil's like, oh, that's not me. I wish it was, but it's not, you know? Sometimes God's like, that's not demonic. I'm trying to correct you because your heart is going to take you off a cliff. So you, you have to have wisdom there. Sometimes it says endure hardship as discipline, saying thank you, God, for this financial hardship because I've been getting too greedy and I need to learn generosity. Thank you, God, for this relational hardship because I think I'm loving, but I'm seeing that my love really ends at this, and God says, I need to expand your love. Thank you, God, for this, because he's trying to shape you and correct you. He says, God is treating you as his child. He doesn't hate you. For what child uh, are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, at least back then, then you are not legitimate. You're not true sons and daughters. If God never corrects you, some of you are like, man, I'm living a life. Nothing ever bad happens, is it? I'm like, oh, that might not be a good thing. Because God's going to use some hardship to correct you. Well, there is no hardship. In my mind, I'm like, oh, that's not a good thing. Are you even a son or daughter of God? And I love, some of us grew up in churches, right, where everything was a blessing. Everything was like, if you're really following God, everything's a blessing. Money's going to come. Hair's going to grow back. Every ministry is going to be fruitful. You're just going to be walking on water and floating around. People are going to, you know. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting because that looks actually nothing like Jesus in the Bible. I don't know where you're preaching from. Now, I'm not saying you're not going to have good times, but when you have hardship, don't view as God abandoning you. He's like, I'm not abandoning you. I'm right here, but I'm trying to change you. Change my circumstance. No, I'm trying to change your heart. Your circumstance won't kill you. Your heart and mind will kill you. Did you ask a question? Oh, right on. All right, cool. I was like, did I just say something off? I know. <laughs> when my daughter Evie was young, I won't say like nine or ten. You guys know me. Uh, our whole family's extroverted. We're wild, right? Ton of energy. And my kids are just like me when I was young. I was, they didn't have ADD medicine when I was in the 80s, but they would have put it on me like early and a lot of it. Uh, I got in trouble all the time. I was a kid. They always moved the desk off to the side of the room, like constantly. Um, and I'm glad I, you know, they didn't medicate back then, so I just had to figure it out after years and years of discipline and things like that and be like, hmm, maybe I should change the way I do things. But uh, so I have kids, and unfortunately, I gave them some of my genes, you know, and so a little wild. And, um, but I remember parking lots, for some reason, my kids just love to go berserk in parking lots. And I'm like, there's cars. 
There's, there's, there's vehicles, but they had no concept that they would die. They'd be like, ah, and they're just running around. Well, Evie, we're outside of Pizza Place. Evie, I'm going to tell a story about you're young, so no fault of your own. You better not do it now, though. You're too old. But, uh, but I remember we were in a parking lot, and, um, and we're walking through. We're done. We ate pizza and everything like that, and we're walking out. And I said, Evie, watch yourself. There's cars because there's a lot of people. And I said, watch yourself. And I was talking to someone, and what did she do? Boom, just starts running. I don't know, after a butterfly, after a make-believe, pro- I don't know. And I said, Evie! I use a dad voice. And she like froze. I'm like, get back here! Now, if any of you would have seen me and you didn't know the situation, you'd be like, oh my God, that is the meanest dad in the world. Like this cute little, I mean, Evie's just a little petite, tiny girl. She had you know, just a beautiful hair like that. Like, oh my, you were the meanest man. Like who, you would have thought, who is this man? I'd rather be mean in the moment and save her life, though, than be a dad that says, like, oh, well, if a parent did that, I can't say what I'd do to them because I'm in church and I'm a pastor, and I don't want to share that with you, but bad things would happen if I saw a human being let a child run out in the middle of the street and get killed. It would be on. And I think God looks at us sometimes and be like, you wonder why I'm angry. I love you, but I'm so angry because we're so passive. We're so passive. Or we get disciplined. We're like, ah, don't tell me what to do. I'm trying to save your thinking life. I'm doing it out of love. Stop rejecting my discipline and my correction. Endure it. He goes on to say in verse 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time. God recognizes. Listen, I'm not saying that you're like, yay, yay for it. I, I recognize that. I'm God. I recognize it doesn't seem pleasant, but painful. But later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. That is childlike faith. You become a Christian when you say, God, I'm dependent on you, not myself. I desire to mimic you, not this world or anybody in it. And I will accept your correction and discipline. And then that's when God works in you and that's when God works through you. I have a picture for you. I want to leave you with this. This is childlike faith right here, you guys. Look at the face of that kid. He is so stoked. But I wonder, as a mom was saying, jump, jump. Have you ever seen the kids at the side of the pool with their, you know, their their bathing suits barely hanging on their little, you know, their little booties, you know, they're just little skinny kids and they they don't want to jump and they're scared. Like in their mind, that pool is a thousand feet deep and there's sharks in there, right? Have you ever seen a kid and they're just, and in your mind, all the adults are in the pool, like, jump, just jump. it's going to be so cute, right? And then when they jump, and they see mama's got you, or daddy's got you, and the joy in their face when it's like, I got you. You guys, as you leave today, I want you to be able to worship right now. I want you to be able to receive God, that you can jump, and he's got you. When he calls you to do something this week, saying, do it in faith, trust me, be dependent on me with your finances, be dependent on me with your relationships, be dependent on me with how you forgive, be dependent on me with your prayers, that when you can trust him and that your goal this week is not to mimic your parents, not to mimic uh, someone that you wish liked you, not to mimic someone at work, but I just want to mimic you. I want to walk like you, Jesus. That's you jumping. And let me tell you this, that kid right now is more, enjoying life more than the kids that are sitting there on, on the cement being like, I don't want to jump. That kid is enjoying life, and you will enjoy life when you have a child-like faith. The worship team is going to come up, and we're just going to worship God. And here's how I want you to worship him. As a father who loves you, as a father who is with you, you're not the grown-up. He is. As a father, you can trust, you can give your worries and concerns, but he's got you. You can't figure out your bills, he can figure out your bills. You can't figure out your future, he's got your future figured out. So that means less stress, more joy with childlike faith. I encourage you as we worship to take communion, just to recognize his love for you. And you can do that by yourself or maybe with family or maybe with friends and and pray together and talk together and just remember him. But he loves you and you can trust him. And not only is it good for you, but it's what will save you with that childlike faith. So Jesus, we come before you now. Let you set up, go for it. Jesus, I pray we'd worship you as a church, that we would worship as children, not as grown adults. Because God, even if we're 50 years old, 60 years old, 
You've been around forever. You look at us like little babies. <laughs> Weak, dependent, not the smartest, not the most coordinated, but you love us. You love seeing us grow up. You love seeing us walk and stumble as you hold us. God, you love to correct us because you realize that as you correct us and discipline us, that then we actually enjoy life even more. God, I pray for our church that we'd have a childlike faith of wonder, of excitement as we jump into your arms. We trust you and we love you, Jesus. Amen. I don't know if you remember, uh, is this on? We good? Okay. I don't know if you remember uh, when you were a kid. I remember when my kids were young. Um, and I remember specifically where Christina had the phone on microphone and she's like, guess who's coming home? dad's coming home and I could hear him like ah they're like they get so excited and I'd open the door and their thing is they used to attach to me they would attach to my legs and I have to walk with them on my feet and they just loved it right just holding on what a powerful name for a small child childlike faith I can't wait for dad to get home I can't wait for mom to get home and some of us we don't childlike faith we have a teenager faith dad's coming home whatever you know, it's just like, it's not the same. And God's like, don't lose that joy. Dad's coming home. Dad loves you. In the same way, you're in trouble. Wait till dad gets home. <laughs> yeah, dad's name carries weight. But he's not doing it because he hates you. It's like, you can't act that way. You can't act that way. But I love you. I hope that imagery of jumping in the pool or being able to hold onto his leg as he walks, he's more powerful than you. I mean, two kids on the, Right? We can hold on to God's hands, his legs, his feet. He's like, I'll walk with you. I got you. But some of us miss being a child, and God's like, I never asked you to leave being a child. Yeah, you transition from your mom and dad, but you're supposed to then have a childlike attitude with Jesus. Not dependent on yourself, but dependent on him. I hope you can find that this week. I hope you're encouraged this week, and I hope if you have kids this week, you love them and cherish them like Jesus loves them and cherishes them this week too. All right, you guys connection groups start this week can't wait to start meeting again see you guys next week chairs go on the racks in the back have a great week take care thanks for joining us for more resources to get involved or to invest in the ministries at access church visit go to take care